All right, so this is a summary video for chapter one before we do, or I, whatever, do the exercises for chapter one. Now, uh, I want to keep some of my commentary to these kinds of videos so that the, when I'm reading the text, I'm just kind of putting that in the record. I, it would be better if you'd get the book and just read that part yourself, and we could take part in the summaries and in doing the exercises. So, uh, now I knew Benson Mates right a little bit because I just had one course from him personally uh, my very first philosophy class if I recall correctly was Logic 1A and we used uh, Mates' Little Red Book but um, but I had a class with Mates himself as he was a professor emeritus I'm sure I've mentioned before and uh, he was translating outlines of Pyrrhonism and there were only like seven people in the class because he was just doing it as a um, um, a seminar, or whatever the word is for this kind of thing. He came back. He was just working through his uh, his translation, and uh, so it was an intimate environment there. And also, you know, he was kind of old at the time, and I would walk him back to his uh, to his office, and uh, just about every class, and but that would take like a half an hour, forty minutes. We were way across campus, so. Um, it's it's interesting having that background. I know a little bit about his sense of humor and how he saw himself. And um, anyway, I, I want to relate some of that because I, I think it was hugely formative in, in a subtle way that I only realized years later. Though at the time, I really just loved this guy. He was awesome. But, uh, you know, his view on skeptics, he had a skeptic friend he would always tell stories about. And his view on skeptics was basically they were a little nutty. But he was fascinated with the, the issue because logically there was basically sound, their arguments. So um, that caught his attention. He was a positivist and just solved some of the issues of skepticism by going, yeah, but I'm going to believe this. Okay, anyway... Um, in that first chapter, he's just trying to get you ready, get your mind ready for how the technical versions of uh, terms like sentences, and you know, we talk about them as if any sentence can be put in logical form, and he just uses the word sentence, and you're supposed to remember that always means declarative sentences. As time goes on, we repeat less and less to ourselves these cautions of, well, it's a subset of natural language, and here's how vagueness and also... Um, not just vagueness of terms, but sort of certain kinds of concepts, like relative concepts. Um, you have to translate them out. You know, you don't want uh, believes that in a logical sense. It, you know, it, that's where it starts to fail. But that's kind of important for human reason, right? So, so we can remember this as we apply this back to human reason. Um, so he wants to discriminate between uh, things that are necessarily true because of the definitions of everything involved and things that are contingent upon reality. This is similar or even the same as the analytic versus synthetic truth distinction that I mention a lot. And he also brings up a distinction between statements that are true because of their logical form versus because of the definitions of the things in them. For example, a or not A is true because of its logical form. It's because of the definitions of logical terms. Whereas all bachelors are male is not true because of the logical form. It's true because of the definition of the word uh, bachelor and male. He also points out that there isn't really exact agreement on which are the logical terms. Again, there's ones we agree on, you know, or, and, not, if, then, uh, the basic ones. But it starts to get uh, fuzzy when you're analyzing natural language. So he wants us to be able to translate natural language into logical forms as well as possible. And I say certain things get well, can get lost in that. When you're when something's true because of its logical form, like a or not a, that's only true for the kinds of things that can be put in place of a in logic. And there is, you know, restrictions on that. For one, it has to be a declarative sentence. And even then, it has to be a certain subset, a certain kind, phrased a certain way. There's certain uh, 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 rules and restrictions. So whatever those restrictions do in terms of taking a subset of all kinds of statements, any statement that you might want to 
the reasonable and logical about that can't be formed that way is not handled in the system. So he wants us to discriminate these kinds of, of truths. He also introduced the, the beginning of the technical work in talking about these matrices. And the, the matrices is basically um, you know, a statement of all your variables. Uh, and there's an exercise in that. And I'm going to have to review the chapter again to get the actual exercise right. That, the exercises, if we do each and every one, uh, could take far longer than the chapters. Um, this book is mostly exercises and, and such. So in terms of the time to get through it, you know, it's uh, misguidingly thin. That's just because there's not a lot of here's how it works. He just seems, says it straightforward, and then you're supposed to be able to do some exercises. So the exercises in the first one, since it's just introductory, I think the most difficult of the exercises is about setting up these matrices, um, which I think is basically just the variableization. This is something I'm having to refresh my memory on. Right? So, but um, so. Uh, there's another introductory chapter where we're, we'll do a little bit more of this, so just getting you ready to look at things in a logical way, using natural language to give you a different perspective until finally you're gonna be, we're going to be using this artificial language, the symbolic language of logic, and we'll already have mastered translating in and out of that, hopefully, or in principle, so we just talk about how the logic works. All right. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. And the next is to start work on the exercises. I have scanned them in so that people can read the exercises. Anybody that is interested in getting this book, tell me. And I might go through this more than once because I, it would be better to have a plan as to what we're going through in principle. Uh, but I'm not going to read this and make a, a lesson plan off of this book. I'm not a teacher, really. We're doing this as a logic group, right? So we're going to read through, but you know, I, I could easily see doing this again and maybe giving it more effort in terms of, uh, you know, if I had the conception right, go ahead and make graphics for all of these as, it, as it's read. Or whatever, whatever idea comes out of it. So, you know, if you don't get the book right away, but um, it, it is expensive. I, Gary pissed me off. and Anyway, uh, uh, but uh, you know, bitching it, this is a $65 book, but you can get it $8 on Amazon, you know, shipment fulfilled by Amazon, and I think it's to its credit, it's, it's, it's like a big old thick textbook, but they, he doesn't waste your time, I, don't you want, finally, there's some s wonderful books out there that are like, it's, this is solid information, this is much information if I had a stack of CDs this big, more, because it's just right there, it's all condensed, and put in, you know, a few sentences instead of on and on and trying to, well, people are stupid, we got to explain it to them this way. He's like, no, get in the frame of mind for thinking a little bit about why we do it, then we're going to get into how we do it, and you just need to be in this certain frame of mind when you're doing logical proofs and things um, in order to master logic. Now, what it is philosophically, how you're going to use it in the real world, that's up to you. This book has a couple inches missing because it's not telling you about your life and how to live it. This is this is what logic is, and now there's a lot more logic than is in this book because this is elementary logic. But this is the logic that goes back to Aristotle. This is the logic with all the millions, if well, possibly millions, whatever, thousands and thousands of proofs and work done on it. This is what Gödel was talking about when he's talking about uh, whether you need a first or second order logic, this is first order logic, this is the part people agree on. Other logical systems generally borrow from the ideas in here, you know, and so you have this predicate logic and it variableized over, uh, over things. That's first order logic, but not variableized over concepts or predicates themselves. Okay, so it's, it's second order logic, you variableize over that, and that girdle proved that there's some weird stuff about that system, like not everything is as and here, if you can translate a statement into this system, then you know a lot of things about what's going to happen in the life of that statement, basically. You can make predictions about things are going to be provable and stuff. A second order logic, not so much. Okay, juice.